guys are in the middle of a project and you can't get anywhere because marketing, engineering, sales, and stakeholders can't finally come to the decision and push the project forward. We've all been there, guys. And there's a few different things that we can do as designers to help push the process forward, avoid design by committee, and see things come to fruition. A lot of these concepts are taken directly from the latest edition of Innovation Magazine. The designer Marshall Johnson wrote an article called It's a Matter of Choice. It's excellent. I recommend that you guys go check it out. I'm going to hit on some of the main points that he mentions in here, expound on them a little bit because it's just awesome. And I think that it's going to really make a difference for you in your design process. There's a problem when you put a ton of concepts on the wall, you can give people over choice, which is a real thing. Too many options can give people analysis paralysis and they're not able to move forward because there's just so many things. FOMO, man. Fear of missing out because if you go with this direction, you're sacrificing one or the other. Don't put too many concepts out there. I can't give you a magic number of how many is just enough. In the article, Marshall Johnson talks about using just five. Earlier on in the magazine, Tucker V. Meister mentions doing three. To each his own. But one common thing that they did mention in both of their articles was the importance of having one throwaway concept. Now be careful with this one, guys, because sometimes they pick the red airing. And if it's something that's not attainable, manufacturable and doable, and it's just so bad that you wouldn't want to tie your name to it, don't put it on the table. Nine times out of 10, they're gonna throw away the red herring and move on to some better options. So I wouldn't overanalyze it too much. There is value in having something that they can just throw away because there's validation as the client that I've been involved in the design process and making decisions. So I chose not to do that. So I see the value. There, there, there's a reason to have a red herring in the mix but be careful. Second thing that's really important to consider as you guys are putting these projects together is the timing of your specific meetings. Having pointless meetings is no fun. In fact, if you're going to have a meeting, it's even suggested, Marshall even suggests that uh, you make them no refreshments and no chairs. Just have everybody stand, cut to the chase. Nobody cares which favorite smear you put on what bagel, let's just get to the point and talk about the project itself. You should have a meeting early on with the people who are involved in the process, so specifically like engineering. Talk with engineering and get a list of their concerns, jot them down, sketch it in front of them, use those skills. There's no competition here between engineering and design. We're supposed to be a family here working together, folks. People will push out engineering, then we have design. Design does their thing, engineering, comes back with plot holes and says, uh, this is gonna make it not work. And at that point, you've already been committed to something. When really, if you just collaborated early on in the process and talked amongst each other and addressed concerns, um, you would have been able to streamline this and get it done a lot faster. So talk with engineering, but not only talk with them, make it a point, even if you're not in love with whatever concept some engineers have come up with, uh, but still make it a point to do some sketch work, to do some concepts that specifically include their points, the things that they talked about with you. One, it's a really good professional tactic to do that because you're validating them as a professional because they've put years of time and effort into becoming who they are today and their opinion matters. So seeing you say, I understand that. I recognize that you have this concern and this is your proposed solution. I'll at least show this in this concept that that was a valid point. Okay, here it is. And whether you're totally in love with it or they're not, doing that gesture and implementing some feedback from other people into your design work is going to go over so well and help you in the long run because you've just won an ally. When you're making a single product, say a drill, I don't know, a drill, make three versions of it. Make your good version, your better version, and your best version. And that seemed like a given, but what I'm saying is, is by presenting three polished deliverables of the same exact thing, the question no longer is, is this the right design direction, this CMF, this 
form factor. This, it, it is no longer about that anymore. It is now about, oh, well, which features do we want to have on this thing? Do we want it to just have the baseline at this price point? Or do we want it to have this midpoint price point and have more stuff? And then, or do we want to have the super whoopee awesome version? Or they look at all of these different options and they pick all of them. If you have ideas on ways that we can take the design process, smooth it over, have positive interaction with people that are on our teams and, and get to the final result quicker, uh, throw them down in the comments. We'd love to hear them. All right. Right after this commercial break, we'll be back. We'll be introducing today's guest speaker. So don't go anywhere. Dentists and patients around the world have been putting themselves in danger to maintain oral health. One dentist decided enough was enough and created an all-encompassing solution. Meet AirGuard, the technologically advanced revolutionary line of products that offers air suction and protection simultaneously. The AirGuard LT is a reusable, recyclable, scratch and chemical resistant guard protecting patients and dentists from one another. The wide curved barrier easily secures to the vacuum that catches any unwanted aerosols before the patient can inhale them. This thoughtful and well-crafted guard can be used in every dentist office in the world. The custom AirGuard MP with a sleek design and a durable polycarbonate finish offers precision four corner spotlights and LED side strip lighting, eliminating the need for headlights and overhead lighting. Color temperature control allows dentists to perform many different procedures. This breakthrough technology gives dentists the ability to work safer with more precision. Blue light enables quicker curing of the epoxy material and amber light allows longer work time. The most technologically advanced product, the AirGuard XP, shares the same impressive features as the AirGuard MP, along with the high definition still and video camera with eight times zoom capabilities. The capability to record audio and video allows patients to review work and use for any insurance claims. Touch, zoom, and pan with ease. The combination of an ergonomic handle and a capacitive touchscreen allows for an intuitive, user-friendly experience. The technology is imminent and the protection is mandatory. This line of AirGuard products is the future of dentistry. Welcome back, everybody. Glad to see you're still here with us. I'm excited to introduce today's guest speaker, tuning in from across the pond in the UK, the founder of Rainlight Studios, Yorgo Lucoria. Rainlight is an integrated design studio operating between offices in London and New York with client collaborations across North America, Europe, and Asia. Part laboratory, part workshop, part studio. Rainlight combines inspired design thinking with business acumen to create products that enhance how people live, work, and play. London-based creative director Yorgo Lucoria discovers the needs of a changing world through cross-cultural research, utilizing an extensive network of experts in various market sectors. A selection of some of Rainlight's internationally renowned partners includes Techno, Scavolini, All Steel, Carnegie, Zumptabel, and Akamura. Yorgo, thanks for joining us here on The Variable. We're excited to have you with us today. Hey, Russ. <laughs> We're glad to hey. have you. Uh, just so hey, everybody knows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you, you know, there's it, going it, it to be sounds... a little bit. I was going to say, for everybody to understand, there's a little bit of a lag. It's going to be like watching the news when the anchor says something. It has to make it all the way up to you, Yorgo. So if there's a little lag, that's no big deal. Just be bear with us, folks. No <laughs> Anyhow, I like I said, I'm excited to have you with us here today, Yorgo. Um, you've got so many things that you've worked on, such a rich design background. I want to give you an opportunity to 
to toot your own horn, talk about Rainlight Studio for a little bit, and, and tell us when you run into folks at a cocktail party, in the elevator, wherever, and they actually start talking to you and ask you what you do, what do you tell them? Well, I, uh, to, to be honest, at a cocktail party, I probably won't talk about it, try to talk about something else, but uh, uh, since <laughs> okay. you're asking, by the way, the introduction was great. It, it sounded really good the way you read it. So for oh. us, you know, <laughs> I think we should talk about that. But uh, no, I, I think, um, you know, Rainlight, the ambition behind Rainlight is, uh, is, is really about unifying two seemingly disparate ideas of business and culture, um, rain, light. Okay. And, you know, the, the the reality is that we need to do both. We need to be good at both. Uh, when yeah. we're doing design, um, we're keying into a world that uh, is, is um, driven by commerce um, or, and participates in commerce. So we have to get that right. But at the same time, because we are designers, I think we also have an obligation to society as a whole, the wider world. Um, mm. And that's the, the part that I would just identify simply as culture. So effectively, while we're seeking innovation constantly, uh, we're seeking to be responsible for our work to people, to the planet. Um, the, other, the other idea behind Rainlight, uh, very important, is, is just the idea of innovation that you know, if we're going to do something like a chair or, or anything else, um, there has to be a good reason for it. And so we're always sure. looking to be relevant to our times, to be part of the times and to produce things that people will feel belong to them. Um, because, uh, you know, the, the way I see it, uh, the work we do is effectively stealing moments from from people, they experience our things and, and then that becomes their experience. So we have an obligation to everybody who comes in contact with our work. Wow. Deep. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. And I, 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 the emotion behind it, um, uh, the way that you approach your design process is just, uh, well, for me, it's inspiring because I, uh, to be, to be honest, I feel like a number of us, uh, it's our nine to five, we get in there, the grind, and we put our heads down in our cubicle, we create concepts and we do it. And, and then the uh, art and soul of product design and development gets kind of robbed from us as an, as an experience. And, and um, maybe I, I want you to go ahead and riff on that just a little bit for us. Like what keeps it so that when you're creating, it still has that, um, it, I don't even know how to describe the, the way that you're talking about creating and um, it, it's a, an emotional experience and you're expressing yourself still so much more almost as an artisan rather than just, oh, I'm a, I'm a designer and I'm grinding away here on my project that has its deliverable due date of this time and, oh, I'm stuck with figuring out this issue with China because they can't get this right in the engineer. It, you lose the coolness of it uh, easily. So what are some of the things that you do to prevent that, to keep the emotion in your work? Because it speaks for itself. I mean, we saw the, the presentation deck with all of your, your yeah. work. Oh my goodness. Wow. Well, very, very nice art form. I, I, it is, it's art the products that you've developed and I just look at it and go, Ooh, very cool. Anyhow, back to the question. Well, that's very uh, kind. How, how do you keep uh, that soul in your work? Well, okay. You, you mentioned nine to five. It's not nine to five, first of all. Um, and I think anything you do and do well, it's going to be more than nine to five. That's a, that's okay, a fact. Yeah. Even if we're talking about, okay. right. Um, and you know, the, the, the top layers are the ones who are working really hard. Uh, in the yeah. gym or in the field, you know, that's just life. And for us, uh, it's the same design doesn't stop when you leave your desk, you, you walk around with it. I design in my head. I think about things I'm working on constantly. It's, uh, it's impossible to turn it off unless I, you know, have to engage in something else to occupy me, you know, whether it's sailing or watching a movie or talking with a friend. But um, sure. no, it's not nine to five. And, and, and frankly, neither should it be. I don't believe it should be. Because, yeah. you know, as I said, it's we have an obligation to to people uh, to get it right. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of 
talk about us maybe being isolated from society, but in fact, very much that's what we are. We're servants to society. We are serving society. Ooh. The, Ooh, I like the that. eyes under which we work is that we're working for a client. And of course we are working for clients and our first priority is sure. working with the client. At the same time, the works that we do, whether it's architectural or whether it's a product, will outlive all of us. And and that's what mm. I think about. That's what drives me. And so if I, um, you know, if I become obsessed about a curve that isn't quite right yet, uh, mm-hmm. or something about the proportions that isn't quite right yet, um, I I feel it physically. You know, it, uh, there's a there's a physical reaction, and you know, I yeah. Um, you know, I have to get it right. Um, maybe it's, it's a kind of obsessive nature, but but nonetheless, that's what I think it takes. And I think, you know, it, it should be difficult because, you know, what are we talking about? We're talking about effectively replacing nature with our works, yeah. right? We, we used to live in nature you know, uh, until just, you know, some few hundred years ago. Um, and... And our obligation is really to create a world because we all live in the designed world, right? We live in, in uh, dwellings that are designed and we have artifacts that are designed and we go onto a street that's designed and we might go to an airport or a train station and we might go to a theater or whatever else, but we're always in a designed environment. And, and so because of that, it means that um, it's got to be created and uh, it has to be created well. So that's the yeah. driver, um, that overarching sense of obligation and responsibility. Oh, there was a couple things that you said there that just ooh resonated with me, and I, I'm going to point them out real quickly because I, I think that's it's great. Because we talk all the time about being passionate about design, and I'm not going to lie. Early on, I was like in in my career as I was going through school and stuff. I'm like. Like, what the heck is that even supposed to mean? Let's be passionate about design. I mean, I get really excited about design and I get excited about the work that I'm doing and I'm invested into it. But what you're just kind of sharing with us is all is eye-opening to the extent that I wrote down, you said, we're replacing nature, which is like, duh, oh, well, we are. But then almost when you hear it and say it that way, that has a weight to it we're replacing nature. We're doing something that's gonna make a big impact. The other thing you said, we're creating something that's going to outlive us. And I gotta, I think this is great. And we should have this mindset as product designers, but I would almost make an assumption and attribute your mindset when it comes to this, to your background in architecture, because I mean, yeah, everybody thinks if I'm going to build some structure, it's going to stand the test of time and it'll definitely outlive me. I mean, you hope so. I mean, if you've done your job right, <laughs> it's going <laughs> to outlive you. <laughs> but but when we're talking about products and chairs and bottles and microphones and computers and stuff, it's all the mindset has shifted to um, how fleeting its life cycle is and how quickly it is disposable and we don't have any gravity to what we're doing and i think if we did a that's where the secret in the passion is because then you know you're doing something not just for the sake of getting it done and not thinking about anything that happens from then on but then you're approaching it with the idea of no this is like my work and it's going to continue on i i I don't know i keep repeating exactly what you said a minute ago but to me it was like a ding bell in my mind i'm like oh how do you instantly have more passion in your work realize the gravity of it and how much of an impact you can make with it and how it can speak for you for a long time beyond your years oof yeah well you know you you you're you're probably right maybe that is driven by what architecture is, you know, it's supposed to outlive sure. us. But I, I, I would argue that products should do the same because yes. effectively what we're trying to do is create beloved objects, right? Um, if we look at 
some of the best bits of design uh, over the past 100 or 200 years, um, or even the last 50 years, it, it, there are some beloved objects, things that you would never throw away, like an Eames yeah. check, you know. Um, so yes. you know, Eames produce things that definitely outlive them, uh, Panton chairs, etc. cetera. Um, so, so really it's about creating beloved objects and it's not just responding to uh, a current whim or a current uh, way, the way the wind is blowing. I think, yes, partly we're living in, our, in the moment, in our times, but also we're living uh, on, a, on a timeline that is potentially infinite, right? And, and that, that's the part that connects to humanity. When, you know, we talk a lot about taste or subjective uh, points of view on what is good design or bad design. Um, you know, it you know it comes back to this idea of something that is timeless. And for me, timelessness means effectively it takes you out of time. It 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 puts you in the moment. It's now you experience an object or a space in a way that you you don't think about the past or the future. You're really in the moment. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's the real challenge for design. We have to we have to do things that are more compelling than uh, plugging into headphones and looking at a screen to be entertained mm. we need to create a reality which is more wondrous than what uh, you can get virtually oh okay good stuff okay you specifically brought up the eames chair and this is kind of taking a shift and we're talking about sustainability and of course passion and so forth but one thing that i thought was really interesting if you uh you recently had an interview with dr andrew dent and you talked about this even more so if you guys have an opportunity i'd recommend going online and looking up rain lights youtube channel and watching the full discussion because it's great um dr dent was talking about the eames chair and and we're talking about plastic waste and water bottles um in the analogy and the thing that he, the the premise of what he was talking about is what really is inherently different about a water bottle's material and the plastic components that get put into an Eames chair? Really, nothing. That, I mean, inherently they're the same. Yet, what do we place value in? Well, obviously everybody places value in the Eames chair, and yet we're creating products with the same materials, and the um, bottle is only as valuable as the water that's in it. And so that was like the example of wisely, like creatively placing value and creating things that it's not really the fact that it's plastic that's the issue, it's what we're doing with it. So Hmm. kind of continuing on what you were just mentioning there in terms of like creating a world that is you know, uh, more fantastic than what you can achieve through a digital space, d- bringing that into the real tangible world and doing better with design and do, um, in-, in creating meaningful products with the materials that we have. Um, I think all of that will have an impact on sustainability. If we all made the shift and started thinking that way, what are some of the things that... <laughs> What can we expect to happen? I guess is my question. Do we think that we can get to the point where we do have zero waste and we are no longer creating pollutants in the ocean? Not because it's not only because it's a good thing to do and we don't want sea creatures to swim in a bunch of muck, but we've created a solution that's so much better in the outcome and we value those materials so much more. I don't know. Is that just like dream world stuff or can that? No. Is that something it's we can anything. achieve? Well, we can achieve anything we want to achieve. It's just a matter of uh, do we want to do it? Um, part, of, uh. part of it comes from how we think about things. So if someone said, design a new water bottle, um, the first question should be, why do we need a water bottle? Uh, you know, Ooh, okay. if we really get down to that question, do we need a, a, a water bottle at all? Um, the only reason we need a water bottle is because uh, it makes it portable. But what if, you know, in Paris, they have um, a very interesting scheme. They basically have these uh, water fountains all over the city. And I don't, I don't mean decorative, you know, angels with uh, water coming out uh, of, a, of a shell. Like or whatever. I potable mean, water Places where fountains. you could fill up a bottle, yeah. right? 
and it's filtered water, it's good quality drinking water. And this to me seems like a tangible solution. So imagine, you know, rather than buying spring water in a bottle, you could have a bottle that has a barcode on it or, or a QR code, and you go up to one of these things that are all around the city and they distribute spring water, right? So there goes the plastic bottle. We don't need it anymore. Um, but it is just a matter of changing the way we live and making commitment to doing that. Because there are a lot of there are a lot of things uh, that we do. For example, smoking. You know, there was a time when smoking was really cool, and yeah. I don't know if you're a smoker, Russ, but you know, no. I, you know, I hope not. <laughs> but but no. you know, there was a time when when it was cool and everybody did it, and uh, we realized actually how harmful it was. And then it there was a sea change. You know, people stopped smoking. Now you can't smoke anywhere. And, and I think it's as simple as that. As a society, yeah. we have the ability to pivot and to change the way we live. Um, we're doing it right now with this pandemic. We're finding alternative ways to live, mm. to be with other people uh, in virtual ways, to share ideas, to work. Um, we can do anything we want to. And so if we, if we really try, yes, yeah. we can do that. I don't think, you know, the whole thing, the whole idea of utopia, um, the, there's a great book, it's called Utopia for Realists. It, it just talks about the idea of utopia, like what we're living right now is a utopia for a civilization uh, three, four hundred years ago. Yeah. They would not believe the way we're living now. We are living in their utopia. And that's how it goes. We have to keep striving for the next utopia and not accept that things are bad and that's just the way it is and we can't do anything to change. Yeah. And I think every single person who's involved in in change in any capacity, whether designing or making or, or living, uh, should contribute to that to that overarching project. So this is where I think optimism comes into play, right? Because if yes. you're optimistic about the future, you will look after it and try to make it better. So it, I think um, a lot of the, I you know, thoughts and ideas and memes that are out there with the negative. Are actually harmful for what I would call the civilization project, you know, which we're all a part of. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know if it's a European thing or what, because Torben Noy was a guest speaker on the variable and, and I'm going to say every European guest that we've had on the show, I'm not sure, but most of them <laughs> have specifically brought up optimism. Right. And I don't know if I, you guys are just more optimistic, happy people. I don't know. <laughs> that, yeah. you, that has specifically been brought up. I don't know if that's in your design background and thing, but I love it. I love it because in he, and I, he said, and I quote, every act of design, every design action is an act of optimism that we can make an impact on the world and we can make a change. And I remember him saying that, and it just stuck with me so much because going through my experience in design in school and stuff, um, I don't know. It, it might seem like a given, but nobody had so clearly and openly said it in that direct way. And it just hit me. And I was like, you're right. Like we wouldn't create anything if we had no hope that it could make an impact, could make a change and be beneficial for the world. And in it is when we're talking about, okay, so I'm going to, Oh, go ahead. I'm going to let you uh, make a comment on that. And then I have a quote from you actually that's on this topic too. But go ahead real quick. Okay, so, so the idea of optimism, I mean, this is something that I remember from architecture school where, you know, so a professor said, you're not, you're not artist. An artist can make a comment on society, meaning you could say society is crap if you want to. Yeah. But if you're designing per se, you have to, your obligation is to make society better. So I, I would say that's mm. the distinction. One makes a commentary, one, the other, the designer has an obligation to make it better, hence the optimism. So, I mean, I don't know if it's a European uh, thing or not, but I, I'm just- <laughs> It's coincidental. <laughs> Maybe, but I, I'm, I'm just conscious of, especially during the pandemic, because I know it was very easy yeah. to despair and to have a negative mindset because of everything that's going on. Mm -hmm. And I really fought against it. I realized that the only way to get through it is to be optimistic. And I think that this is, probably the, the key to life, really. You mm, just have to yes. believe that you will make things better and, and uh, life will be better and 
you will be better. And if you constantly have that drive, then uh, if we all have that drive, we will, we will indeed succeed in doing that. Because you know how it is. If you try to do anything um, and you have a setback, if you believed in the beginning that you weren't going to succeed, you're going to stop. You're going to give up. But if you yeah. believe from the outset that you will succeed, you won't stop until you do succeed, right? So this is where we want to make change. We have to believe that it will succeed. That's a prerequisite. It's not even an mm. option. Sorry, we go on. We have to believe we can <laughs> succeed. No, this is great. No, it's great. Don't don't stop. Okay. Well, going on with that, uh, I think this is, falls right in line. Uh, you had a publication entitled In 20 Questions, and you were asked, if you look to the future, what do you see? And what you said is, and this is just... Mm, a poetic existence, a world built on human values and responsibility to manifest beauty in all its forms. We're going to stop communicating via virtual messaging, and we're going to stop trying to buy our happiness with objects. We will realize that life's fleeting moments are precious. Relationships are meaningful, and our sole purpose is to become better in our own humanity. Amen. Like... I love, yes, <laughs> Woo, preach. Oh, I mean, what a, and, and I guess the one thought when I read that and I was like, oh, that's great. And, and the Debbie Downer in people will be like, yeah, we can't do that. Why? Why not? Why can't we get that? And then the one question that I wrote after reading that is, what is keeping us from attaining this future? I mean, I have my thoughts, but uh, I want you to say, what's stopping us? Belief, lack of belief, lack of faith. Belief. I mean, you know, faith in the future, faith in faith in in ourselves. Um, what? Um, see, this is the thing. I mean, I, I sometimes talk about social media as being and having a negative influence on us. And what I what I refer to, I don't mean, I don't mean it in the sense of you know, it, it does help us in some ways to communicate sure. ideas. But I, what I don't like is the fact that it's propagating negative thoughts and negative mm. ideas and because of that it gets into people's minds and it does yeah. influence the sense of optimism so this is where you know i say about stop communicating via virtual messaging part of that and i'm not saying we will you know i think it would be good if we did I, sure. you know, here I, go. I, I should be i should have more confidence and believe that we will but <laughs> the, you know the problem with virtual messaging obviously is that we are limited in what we can say to each other because of time, because we have to be quick, and because we're using our, our thumbs, we cannot put real emotion into it. So we use emojis, which is, you know, one of the five uh, kind of pre-established uh, uh, emotions. Um, yeah. In, instead of just being who we want to be in part. And so really that limits our, our own thinking and our own capacity to feel because we, we are not getting into those finite elements of emotion that are, you know, in between the emoji, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think what's, what's stopping us from attaining that better future is just nothing but ourselves. You know, we have to be committed to the prospect of living better and uh, creating a better world. And that can only be done by a commitment that each of us makes to ourselves. Um, and that's, and that's yeah. hard to do. That's, that's very hard to do. It sounds like, uh, maybe it sounds easy, but it's not easy. Um, and yeah, yeah. it involves discipline, it involves maybe sacrifice, and it involves also a sense of establishing values that um, are maybe inconvenient, right? Because mm -hmm. we live in a world of, convenience let's face it our lives are pretty convenient um yeah. so if we were able to sacrifice the plastic water bottle that you can buy from a shop and whim um for the idea that you need to think ahead and before you leave the house bring your bottle um and you'll have a place where you can fill it and so on and a lot of people do that um yeah. you know which is brilliant but it's it's those little things i mean that's just one example but it's those little things of, of convenience that we need to be willing to bear a little bit of inconvenience sometimes in order to have a better life. Because 
you know, yes, it's easier to get a takeaway because it comes to your door, sweaty person on a bike gives you bags and, and you can eat. And then you have all this yeah. mountain of rubbish to throw away, which, you know, that's the bad part. Um, yeah. You, know, you, you now just created all this waste, right? Uh, sometimes it's mm -hmm. plastic and things like that. So if we're all doing that, we get into a situation where we're creating a real problem. You know, we're creating a lot of garbage because that rubbish, you cannot really do much with it, you know, yeah. unless, we, yeah. unless we figure that out. Um, so but that's where the thing about being, you know, willing to overcome inconvenience uh, is an important aspect of creating that better future. That's just we it. need to be willing to be to overcome inconvenience to, to accept it. To, yeah, we we are very much needing to be satiated with our desires and needs immediately yeah. as a culture. And I think yeah. we've fed that over time. So we'd have to unlearn that in order to see us build a better world. Well, I think another thing that we kind of talked about that ties into this last episode, we had Bob Baxley on the show and we were, he shared what I called the parable of the blue button and it's talking about UI UX and the blue button essentially long and short of it is, is he didn't, he was building some interface, mocked it all up. And some other person in the staff said, this button needs to be blue on the screen. Blue doesn't match their color palette. Blue doesn't match. You know, there's a number of reasons why Bob was like, no, we're not making the button blue. And long and what ends up happening is the person ends up going behind his back, changing the color blue, talking with other people. He has a, heated conversation with this person. Why is the button blue? I said no to the blue button. And they said, well, it needed to be more prominent. And he's like, ah, there's like 10 different ways that we can make this button more prominent. Like, right, it, you identified the problem and automatically jumped to a conclusion. So where am I driving at? I think that a number of things are the way that they are because we've automatically assumed a solution to the problem and we've been sticking with it for so long now that it is hard to unplug ourselves unmarry ourselves from this particular solution like you're talking about water bottles and stuff what is it that makes it so that we need a water bottle oh we need it to be portable so that we can have access to water when we're places where it's not accessible well what if it were accessible everywhere okay but then in your mind you said but then is it going to taste good okay all of them are filtered okay they're filtered, but is it going to be hot? Okay, all of them have, they're they're cooled. You know, if it, quickly, if you can find solutions to get rid of all of the excuses as to why you need to carry a water bottle, then you can't really complain when suddenly we mandate there's no water bottles anymore and everybody's like, oh, darn it. Well, I guess I'll just have to use the fountains that are conveniently placed everywhere for me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So there's there's solutions that we can explore, and yet we're still tied and married to the dang blue button. <laughs> yeah. And it's killing us, <laughs> you yeah. know? Anyhow, I think that it would be good to move on to the topic of hypocrisy. We like to get a little bit... Con um, confrontationals every once in a while bring up some stuff that's interesting a good friend of mine just recently was watching a design awards ceremony and he sent me this message i won't throw him under the bus and say who he is because a lot of you guys would probably know him but this is what he said he says people go on about how design needs to be more inclusive and yet they speak in terms and phrases that are so exclusionary and pompous. The average person out there will be would be insulted by how they are attempting to sound. So they are hypocritical. They are making the concept of design more obscure than it ever has been, which is pretty damned obscure. That's what he said that we as a design culture are doing as we are doing design presentations and we're showcasing everything that we're doing and how we present ourselves is in a uh very pompous as he says fashion is how we're doing it so we're ending up shooting ourselves in the foot as we're trying to be approachable 
yet we are making design super obscure and 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 complicated that's the, so that's where he's coming from first question do you mm. agree you think we are doing that as a design culture um i, I don't know if i agree I mean, first of all let's look at the word inclus inclusivity um you know the first time i heard this word i thought it was uh farcical because um okay. you know the idea that we have to consciously be inclusive is a little bit like saying buildings have to defy gravity they have to stand up and oh. of course they do and so does a chair yeah. need to stand up and a table and yeah and um this whole idea of somebody telling me that we have to design inclusively was just i think farcical you know the, the whole idea that and, and i had a conversation recently with with Roseanne Somerson, the president of RISD. And, um, you know, she, she says something beautiful about that. The idea that inclusivity suggests that there's some kind of exclusive club and then we have to allow everybody into it. Um, yeah. and, and I think that's the problem with the word. Uh, you know, this, there's this idea that we have to now make design for the wider family of humanity, which, uh, it's supposed to be from the beginning. Isn't that what, yeah, isn't that what we've yeah. been doing since uh, the thousands of years we've been at this? And I don't think it's any different now. So I, I think this is, this is a word that I could, um, so in that sense, I agree. Um, it's an unnecessary term if designers do their jobs properly and they work in a, in a way that uh, serves humanity, then it will be for everyone. Um, sure. And that's that. Um, the idea that we're pompous, I don't know. Um, you know, if we use uh, certain words and phrases that sound a bit ex um, uh, exclusionary because they are hard to understand. I mean, you know, I think every profession has a way of talking. If if a doctor talks, we won't understand it either. Um, sure. You know, when 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 I talk to a client, I I talk to a client in a way that they will understand me, regardless of who they are. So, mm -hmm. you know, we, we establish a common language and that's part of communication. Um, sure. If we talk to each other in this kind of pompous way, I mean, words are not a substitute for good design. So if we talk uh, in big ways about design, it doesn't make us designers. The proof is in the pudding. Okay. Yeah. And, and really mm. it comes down to the same thing. Design is damned to do well. It is. Um, you know, and, and that's really what we should be doing is good design. And the way we talk about it, well, that's just, um, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't think we're pompous, though. I mean, if, if, if we're perceived as pompous, it certainly isn't, it wouldn't be my intention. Um, as sure. I said, I feel grateful whenever I have an idea, you know. Um, yeah. And whenever I start a project and I, you know, I, when you start a project you don't have an idea you start with at least i do i try to not start with a preconception and that's a terrifying moment and i'm really grateful when I, when I, when an idea comes it comes from but the ideas come um yeah. so you know being a designer is is a is a tough job and the kind of yeah. struggle that we go through is not visible to other people and uh i don't know maybe it seems like we're talking to fairies i'm not sure but um uh, I certainly wouldn't say that we're pompous because, uh, you know, we we have to be humble. That's mm. so whatever we create, we have to be humble. So yes. I don't think uh, okay. it has a, a word there. But our struggle is a, it's a real struggle, you know, to do good design. It's a real struggle. It's, yes. it's hard work. It is. That's what I would say. Well, <laughs> why don't you guys throw your comments in down below? What do you think? Are we just a bunch of pompous jerks and we're talking out of both sides of our mouth? I don't know. Why don't you guys stick around? We're going to have a quick commercial break and then we're going to continue this conversation here with the Order Luke Thank you.
All right, everybody. Thanks for sticking with us. I, I want to take a quick second and um, encourage all of you to take a moment to subscribe and support this channel. We appreciate all of these. A number of these questions were sent in by our subscribers, our followers, uh, your um, activism really makes a big difference. We really want to hit on topics of design and creativity that appeal to you, that make a difference. Uh, we would love um, for all of you to finish every single episode and just be inspired and come away with all kinds of variables of goodness to apply to your daily work. So I'm going to jump right back into this. If you have questions, be sure to throw them into the chat. You're more than welcome to message us there and we'll include them. But um, moving on, I, I I have something else here a year ago uh, that I dug up from 2011. I'm just here to ruffle some feathers and I'm excited because this is so good. Okay, 2011 interview, Yorgo Lucoria, industrial poet. Ooh, that title. Uh, you said, <laughs> this is good. I wanna get, I'm, I'm, we're gonna get your raw reaction to this and then let you come back at it since it's been a, it's been a minute since you originally made this quote back in 2011. So you said, listen, minimalism is a dead end. Everyone is producing a box and a circle and a square. And then what? Where's the difference between, well, now is it a lappy? You were talking, so this is one of your clients. What's the, the difference between a lappy and so-and-so? There's none. We need to go beyond that. We need to dig deeper, invent a new language, but it's, but it's one that is still purist. It's not frivolous. You continue on to say, I mean, blob architecture and blob design, which has been around for a while now, has a very was very cool in the beginning, but it's become like minimalism, anonymous. You don't sense the mind of the designer in it anymore. I design in CAD software as well, and I know how easy it is to do those things and get cool results and impress in terms of formal complexity, but that's more about the tools that we use rather than why are we doing this? If we're going to produce another product, a chair, a basin, a lamp, it's got to be meaningful. Otherwise, don't do it. Ooh, <laughs> some strong words. I love it. So um, my question is, after reading that, it's been a few years since this interview. Um, my, oh, I jotted down. I feel like we can still say the same thing today. Um, I don't know. Has your perspective changed since this interview? And what are your thoughts on where we're at now as opposed to then? No, thanks for you making me read here. Uh, a, um, <laughs> thanks for I, um, you know, I, at least I'm glad I didn't say something that I don't agree with today. So I do still agree with that. Good. Um, yeah, <laughs> okay. I mean, absolutely. And um, really, I, I guess what I'm saying. Um, you know, the idea of minimalism, minimalism is a dead end. Um, it's, it's just to say that it doesn't have any um, interpretation of uh, or, or quality of emotion, um, this sort of purist. Of, and the one word I ch would change is this idea of purism. By that, uh, and I re redefined that term since then, I call it clarity. And, clarity. you know, for me, clarity doesn't necessarily mean that it's simple because it could be complicated. It could be Baroque. It could be, you okay. know, uh, high Gothic cathedral that's very ornate. Um, but what it has is clarity. There's a real intention and um, and uh, achievement of beauty. Um, so the word for me now is clarity, and that okay. you know that that goes beyond any style or dogma or way of thinking um, to to capture what I would effectively call a design that touches people. Um, you know, ultimately, when I say, what I say something about, it has to have meaning. Uh, what I mean mm -hmm. is it has not meaning for the designer, but it has for, for people who encounter it. And for me, that means that there's a kind of poetic exchange, a kind of resonance, you know, same kind of thing if you see, uh, if you watch a sunset or if you just stand next to a shoreline and you watch the waves or if you're at a campfire and you watch the flames, you know, there's something that is kind of primordial almost in, in those experiences. Mm -hmm. And I do think that as designers, when we get it right, we have the opportunity to touch people in those ways on a subconscious level w without words. Um, but um, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so that, that's why anything that's kind of stylistic, um, like an application of something uh, in order to achieve a certain currency uh, is to me without value. The real value comes from things which are done with intention and which are done with uh, uh, a sense of emotion in the creator. Because I do believe that when you try to capture a certain emotion in the work that you do, you will achieve it and that will be communicable. Um, there's this great movie, a Mexican movie called like Water for Chocolate. And it's okay. a brilliant, you know, the, the idea is that there's, a, there's a, a woman, she's a young woman who, uh, when she, whenever she cooks, her emotions are translated into the meal she's making. And so if she's upset okay. and she's crying, suddenly everybody at the table is crying as they eat her dish. Uh, <laughs> uh, feeling exactly. amorous. They all feel amorous and so on. Um, and, and it's absolutely a, a brilliant idea. And uh, I think in a way, sign could be like that. But that also demands that our audience is also tuned into their own emotions and they're not sitting on their phones, right? That they're actually paying attention uh, to sure. reality and willing to engage with it. Um, I would say that perhaps because of too much bad design, people have turned away from reality, especially if you look at people walking down the street, a you know, busy street, any, any big city, most of the time they tend to be chaotic, um, a lot of discord, the soundscape is awful, you know, sirens and things. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that is what it makes people go inward and, and turn away from the world around them. So, but now imagine if we could design all these places with care so that even the lamppost or the fire hydrant or the phone box, whatever, we don't have phone boxes anymore. But everything in it, the, the, the rubbish mm -hmm. bin, you know, has a sense of harmony and beauty with the environment that it's in. Um, you know, the paving, um, the lighting, and so on. The, you know, planting trees and flowers to, to bring a sense of nature to our surroundings. I think if we did that more effectively, people would probably be more to unplug and connect with the real world. Um, sure. So. Yeah, so it's a two-way street. Number one, we have to do our job as designers, and number two, we hope to have an audience that audience, you know, that will participate with us and actually mm -hmm. um, engage with the work that we do and just feel it uh, and, and to understand it emotionally, not intellectually, not the big words, not the pompous way that your your friend suggested. <laughs> it shouldn't be pompous. Yeah. You, you, you know, you cannot communicate ideas like that. If you want to communicate those kind of like those kinds of ideas, you should write a book but you can communicate sure. emotions with the design. Mm. So many things that you've brought up today that are just kind of popping out into my mind. A lot of the undertones of our discussion kind of remind me of the interview that I had with Scott Henderson when he's talking about flow state. And there's a lot of similarities as you're talking about design being a struggle as you're striving to come to a, a solution, a meaningful solution. Um, you know, that that will, like you said, encourage that engagement with our the, the audience, the users, the people at the end to unplug to to pay attention to it. And he even goes in, into detail regarding like, you know, he, he kind of demystifies the sense of, OK, how is it that we just have abstract forms, you know, and one abstraction resonates with us more than another? Well, he attributes that to flow, that there's a number of different um, uh, variables, different aspects of nature that as they are repeated and come together and intersect almost like bubbles forming a cube, if you do it, if you blow them just right and everything, there's things that can be geometric and there's things that resonate with us because in nature they occur as things um, uh, are overlapping and repeated numerous times in in what he describes as we're struggling to come to a good, meaningful solution that just feels right is it's as soon as we get into that flow state. And both of you kind of, um, when I listen to you talk about 
the effort that needs to go into it to achieve that. And I think that is how you're describing a transcending mode of design, not just, well, let's keep it minimal, straight lines and some circles and do this. It's got to look like it was made by um, Apple everywhere, because if that were the case, everywhere would look like that. And I can't even fathom what a street lamp post would look like. And would it really be better? Would it really um, it cause that meaningful engagement and do and have the same result if everything were made that way? Um, that's not to say I, I I think my argument for minimalism is almost that there's a scaffolding, a structure um, that gives you a foundation to build on. And what do I mean by that? Uh, we do as designers need to establish um, some get we have to walk before we can run, we have to start with the soft foods before we jump into the meat and potatoes of things. And um, getting into a habit early on of identifying um, Activities that are generally attributed to minimalism, cutting back and removing things that are unnecessary. And I think that's a good stepping stone to eventually getting to what we're talking about is, okay, you've got that. Now, what can you do to be even deeper and more creative in balancing? I wanted to say an artist, but you've now changed that definition of my mind because an artist just puts out whatever he wants as you said but a designer is out there to make society better so we're it's our higher calling we aren't just artists who are willy-nilly putting something out that we like just because it seemed cool to us it, it all is with purpose uh the the gravity of it all if we approached it that way and we had the struggle and the goal and the vision to have that kind of purpose, um, I think it would definitely help us hit a new level as designers than just aspiring to make our stuff look like cool boxes in circles. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But but in the, <laughs> yeah, got it. Um, Fans of artists. I mean, I'm not saying that that artists are doing that. I'm saying art in general has that kind of look, right. Um, okay. You can go into a gallery and see work that has that kind of, uh, you know, it's a sort of uh, reactionary piece. Um, I bumped into Anthony Gormley, the artist, the sculptor, at the Venice okay. Biennale a few years ago, and um, you know, he he was um, he was upset about something uh, uh, about something another artist, perhaps I can't remember exactly, but it stuck with me. He said, "Form matters. Form matters," and. Um, you know, he's an artist saying that. So, you know, form really matters. Form matters, yeah, because okay. it affects people. It affects. Yeah. People. So, when you when you do things, whatever you do, it will affect people. You know, in a, in a, in a way, like um, think about the movies that that are being created. Um, you know, there are certain kinds of films that are just out to shock with uh, the sense of violence and ugliness and so on. And, uh, you know, yes, maybe there's an audience for that and maybe there's something that's, you know, served by that. I don't know what it is, but, but effectively for matters, what we put into people's minds and consciousness as, as artists or designers will, if, will in fact have a mass influence because a lot of people mm. will be affected by it. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to clarify that. I'm not saying. Yeah, no, that, that, that's good. Bad and designers are good. I don't say that. No, oh. no, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, there's different roles and purposes and responsibility. With, with art, you can have the license to, you, you putting yeah. it out there and making a statement. But designers, we have a mission as well. Oh, yeah. man, you're go. I could just go on and on. But unfortunately, we have limited amount of time. And I know you've got a lot of things going on in your busy schedule. Every episode. I've missed it the last couple times. I can't believe it. The name of the show is The Variable. And at the beginning, I was good about doing it. And I've missed it a couple times. And I want to make sure this time we talk about it before I let you go. Um, the Variable, 
well, I ask everyone, what is your variable? Meaning, what is your secret sauce? The thing that because you've held on to this, it has made such a difference in your design career. It's been a catalyst of change for you and brought you where you are today. So what, Yorgo, is your variable? I'd say, well, I think um, the realization that the work we do has to affect people in a positive way. Um, the idea of bringing poetry to design. And Ooh. that comes just from being, you know, a, a student of design architecture where you, you start to realize why you fall in love with the profession and you want to do it. And that first of, of love that you feel is that inner uh, resonance to an object or a place that you find. And that for me was the driver of, I want to do that. Um, uh -huh. It happens uh, not just in that, it happens also in literature, it happens in film. But it's that feeling that awake of a more uh, substantial reality than the basic one that we be in touch. You know, that you get inside of yourself in this way to, to, you know, learn something about yourself or about life or about the universe. And, and yeah, that's that kind of higher state of being that, that design can evoke, I believe. Um, so yeah. it, it was really a thing that I studied and, um, you know, primarily in architecture, but to this day, where there'll be certain forms that really stop me in my tracks, you know, like I could stand mm -hmm. in front of, uh, um, you know, I love going to art galleries and I especially love sculpture. And I could stand, if, if something gets to me, I could stand there for hours just looking at it, gazing over every curve and detail until I can internalize it, you know. Um, mm. And, and it's, it's that kind of, uh, I think that's what it is for me. And, and really my commitment to, to the client that I'm going to give them that. I'm going to give them that passion. I'm going to give them that insight. I'm going to give them that, you know, all, all that I developed uh, as, as my skill set, as my craft. For all these years, I'm going to apply that to something that then will belong to them in some way. And so that's really the commitment that, uh, so that would be my variable, I guess. That's your so. variable. Man, just the thing that as you're talking that you've inspired me, man, hearing bring poetry yeah. into design. I'm like, get inspired and, and take those moments. Is there, that's one thing that, I think to myself, when's the last time I was walking by something and just stopped and noticed it and studied it and loved it for its form, for what it is. And I don't think we give ourselves enough of those opportunities. To, we're, we're too distracted. We're too plugged in to whatever. And those things, cert, def, taking those moments certainly can make or break in you, your inspiration and your flow in, in, in what you're able to produce by taking the moments to find the poetry in design. I think, I think that's really good. Um, wow. Yorgo, we appreciate you. Thank and you, man. All of your insight that you've shared with us. Thanks for joining us on the show today. Like I said, I could talk forever with you, but, um, we, we look forward to seeing how Rainlight continues to kill it in the design world and be successful. Stay in touch. And should you ever need anything, uh, I'd love to, love to collaborate with you in the future, okay? It's a big pleasure. All right. Thank you very much, Russ. All right. We'll see you next time, guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you all.